With me for the duration of the show tonight is my fabulous panel, uh, Maya Tusi, political commentator and broadcaster, Alice Watson-Brown, political commentator, and Peter Edwards, former editor of Labour List. Uh, brilliant to have you all with us. Uh, first of all, Alice, are you a football fan? I can't claim to be, no, although I wouldn't complain if Liverpool won. No, won't. I have. Right, OK, well, that's good to know. And I'm trying to think, oh, they've got American investment, of course, the Fenway oh. Sports yeah. Group. But are you concerned about the ownership of English football Premier League clubs? Well... From an outsider, it's nothing new about the dark money that goes into football associations. Um, no, I don't think there's any problem with foreign investment, as you say, comparing it to Chelsea. Um, I think it, it's businesses' rights to invest in these clubs, and it is a huge part of our national culture. And I think to undermine smaller clubs with less funding in getting their way to the top, I think that's wrong. Uh, and, of course, Mayor, the bottom line is that many clubs could have a look at where the money comes from, and it might raise eyebrows. Well, of course, um, but at the same time, uh, football is one of those specific industries where if it were any other like business sector, we focus on the fact that it's free market capitalism. Uh, mm. Who's going to get involved? Do you want the government to get involved? Whereas the problem with football is that because it's very tribalist and it's very uh, an emotional industry, you, you are going to have sometimes certain um, people in certain areas who would of course, scream and shout about some of the things that they're not happy about. But as long as you know that everything's legal, as long as you know that anything that the, the foreign investors do in this country goes with our rules, there's absolutely no problem. Yes, what do you think about this, Peter? Are you a football fan? I'm a big football fan and I have huge concerns about what's going on in Newcastle. I spent a lot of time in Newcastle. It's a great city and the people deserve a great club after the stagnation of the Mike Ashley years. But I'm really worried about what's happened this week. Um, the Saudi takeover of the club and you have to ask where the money comes from and about the human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia, just like you have to ask where Roman Abramovich's money comes from. I would say uh, Roman Abramovich took over Chelsea, funded um, with the wealth of assets that should be owned by the Russian people. Well, these are all important questions to ask, but do you want to actually reject that investment? I mean, Peter, for example, this will be great news, of course, for Newcastle United as an organisation, but it will be great news for the city too. It will be great news for the city and Manchester City, who we've not talked about so much. Mm. Um, again, owners, a lot of questions are asked about the owners of Manchester City, quite rightly. Um, and their pushback is always they've re tried to regenerate parts of the city of Manchester as well. And they haven't just poured the money into club facilities and young men and uh, now female footballers who are quite well paid already. So will there be regeneration of parts of the Newcastle? I hope so, as there has been in parts of Manchester. But you still have to ask, where does the money come from? And is it money that should belong to the people um, rather than a handful of rich individuals? Although, Alice, is it wrong to single out Premier League football clubs? I don't think so. Um, I think they represent the highest level of football. Um, mm. And I think they deserve to have the scrutiny that the public wants. Um, however, I mean, if you were a Newcastle United fan, you'd be celebrating tonight. Yes, I think you would. I think you're, if your club has the chance to be propelled to the top of the league, then why wouldn't you celebrate? That's what money gets you. Yes, I mean, we do it, it deals with China, for example. They've got an appalling human rights record. So much property in this country is Chinese owned. A lot of debt is Chinese owned, Alice. So I just think to actually focus on one particular English Premier League team is a bit ridiculous. The bottom line is that we live in a globalised world and there is a lot of dirty money out there. I agree. And I think Britain can do well as an example to prove, even though they will associate themselves with these countries who have poor humans or human rights records, we will show them wrong by mm. committing to our own human rights in our own country. I think that's right. And do you think, Mark, that mm. the mood in football is changing now? Foreign takeovers, we've had those for many years. It's well over half the Premier League um, owned by foreign businessmen and women and conglomerates. But is something changing in football with the World Cup? going to Qatar, migrant deaths and criminalisation of homosexuality, it could be that the Premier League is starting to wake up to some of these ethical issues. Although I wonder, Peter, whether the chairmen and chairwomen of these Premier League clubs who are so upset about this deal will be boycotting the next World Cup. I doubt it. Well, that's the question I ask as well. I mean, formally, it's not the Premier League clubs that boycott the World Cup. It's the FA. I think it's 
very unlikely. I'm sure they'll be invited to go, and I'm sure they'll attend, though, Peter. Yeah, that's a fair point. Will they attend as quote unquote VIPs? But uh, the buck ultimately stops with the FA. So, assume England qualify for the World Cup in Qatar, which looks very likely, they would, of course, if, if I could say, have a choice not to go. Yeah. And I think politically, I'm a big football fan, I want to see the World Cup, but. Politically, if you're taking a moral stand, it's questionable whether England should go. Can I say one thing quickly? Because there's two different points. I agree with, um, I don't disagree with Peter when he says, you know, questions should be raised. Generally speaking, with any investment, any situation. But if we go down the route of uh, comparing a, an estate or a country or a city hosting a World Cup or uh, the Olympics to some business person who happens to be from that country, that's accidental xenophobia because, you know, the, of course, make sure that the money is right, make sure they're not breaking the rules. But are we just saying that just because someone is, you know, from China or from somewhere, that that means that definitely the money is uh, coming from the, the bad regimes? I mean, China is actually a bad example because it usually does. Uh, but and also, if we're going to get into the fact that we have to get them to, for example, force them to invest into the areas that we want to. Uh, it's, it's not our job. It's the job of the, the board of the clubs to decide and obviously the investors. You know, otherwise, this is protectionism. If hold on, hold on. Free. But what's xenophobic about asking where money comes from? No, I'm, I'm fine with that. But it, it, the, the kind of putting the, uh, the World Cup hosts uh, like Qatar, which I'm you know, quite sceptical about, uh, in the same category as an investor who happens to be from Russia, for example, uh, or from Qatar, uh, don't kind of, they're not the same thing. You know, someone is just a business person who happens to be from Qatar, and Qatar government, Qatari government hosting the World Cup is two different issues. Um, but here's the point, Peter. Premier League clubs could bankrupt themselves by turning away foreign investment. Britain could bankrupt itself by turning away foreign investment. Uh, this is the nature of the world economy. We do business with everyone. Well, we do do business with everyone, and I think we've also got to accept that there's not much that's British about the Premier League. There are British players in the Premier League and it's British people paying for it to um, put bums on seats and satellite TV subscriptions and so on. There's not that much British about the Premier League. But I think your wider point is that there are ethical decisions at every level of business investment. And whether that's football or um, something like Huawei that Theresa May's government tied itself in knots over. Mm. And uh, I think governments really, really struggle with this, just like the Premier League has struggled with it, because at the end of the day, uh, football clubs, however big, however global, are community institutions. Um, also, let me ask you all whether you are offended by terms like uh, manpower. Uh, what are your thoughts about this? Forefathers as well, Alice. Um, well, I'm sure this is probably targeted at women like myself. I couldn't really give less of a toss that I was born a woman. And if you're saying manpower, I won't get offended if you use a gender term. It's like saying the term sisterhood as well as men can also be feminists. I don't think it's exclusionary. I don't think it's bad. I think there are far bigger problems in the world and people really don't need to bother. Uh, Maya, what do you think about this, uh, this particular uh, missive that comes from the University of Aston? I mean, you've got the, the things coming from universities and BBC trainings, and the latest that I have is the, the Minister of Defence uh, doing a language uh, a guide. And the problem I have is not just the uh, kind of the idiocy uh, of, uh, kind of you have some people deciding what's right or wrong in any moment. It's just confusing. Until five, ten years ago, they said that you can't, you don't say woman, women, say females. Now they've come out and say, no, no, you have to say, no, the, the other way around, they said, uh, say females, not women. Now they say you have to say women, not females. I'm like, it's hard to keep up. So no wonder that the, the liberal left and the woke side, they're still not even united behind their own cause because they can't even agree with each other. Peter, what's your view about this missive in terms of the language that students are using, are using at the University of Aston? Well, I, I've not read the whole missive, but what's wrong with being sensitive about your language? What is wrong with referring to manpower and woman power? Because it's, it's politically correct. No, no, oh, no. But that's giving an opinion about why you don't Well, like let, me, let me give you an example. What, what is wrong let me give with you the an word example. woman power? Well, well uh, there's nothing wrong with it, but I think that it's rather patronising to women that I they agree. need a special word, which is woman power. Yep. And why can't a woman deliver man power? Because man power is a sort of generic, non-gender specific term. I'm, I'll give you another one. The, the word masterful has been banned by the University of Aston. I mean, the fact that a university is banning words shocks me in the first place, Peter. But... Uh, masterful. Now, as far as I'm concerned, Emma Raducanu was masterful in the US women's singles final of the tennis. She was masterful. It was a masterful performance. 
I think masterful is probably a, a different type of word to manpower and woman power. You know, in the GB News... Well, it's yeah. one of the banned words, Peter. Well, because it's got the word master in, which is very colonial and rather, rather sort of patriarchal. There's a broader problem, I think, which you're alluding to and is all over the papers every weekend, which is universities stifling debate. We have to accept, especially on TV, there are some words we don't use. And often those, and I'm not going to say them, obviously, because oh. there are some words that are very offensive and we... Hopefully we don't think those words and we don't have them on TV. But yes, but most rational people know not to use those words. Yeah, they yeah. draw the line appropriately. But, yeah. but, the, but, but those, being but... treated as though we are always irrational, yeah. innocent till proven guilty doesn't happen anymore. You're always possibly going to be guilty of racism if you don't have a Mars bar at work or yeah. you know, misogyny or if you don't have an orange juice. I mean, yeah, also there are certain words that say socially they're just not acceptable because they, they have one obvious meaning. Whereas certain the other words that you know, Mark was saying, for example, manpower or any uh, words that have man in it, uh, it's very subjective because, firstly, a lot of the, like mankind is not actually about man. It's just a shorter version of humankind, essentially. And then when Justin Trudeau changes it to people's kind, just because it thinks it says man, that those words are subjective. And Peter actually proved that point. That said, well, technically, masterful is different, but they, like man power, woman power is different. You've already proven the point that it's so subjective that even the woke side, some of them will say, well, no, this should count. This is OK. We don't even know how to keep up. Well, isn't that the problem, uh, quickly, about having hard and fast rules that, uh, as we've all alluded to, I think, is actually about judgment, isn't it? And about sensitivity yeah, absolutely. and treating yep. people as adults yes. rather than that, uh, do not do this, do not do that. And the other thing about language is, of course, it evolves with every generation, True. if not every year. Well, I agree, but the point is that these institutions are prescribing which language we can use, Peter, and surely that's a concern, and surely the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer, should be standing up against that. The Prime Minister, in his conference speech, said he will be tackling this woke nonsense. Why won't Keir Starmer do the same? Well, I'm not sure calling it woke nonsense is really helpful. I think there's an agreement that it's good to be sensitive about your language, and I think we've all got concern that university bosses have gone too far in terms of prescription. What's Keir Starmer going to say about it? We'll just have to wait and see. I'm confused as to why you, you seem to think that women need to be treated with some abject sensitivity. We are more than capable of saying when we're unhappy if we're being called something annoying. I mean, I think it's up to the personal choice. If you don't like being called so-and-so, you can say, please don't. And then if, if the person you're talking to is kind and normal, mm. then they will go, apologies, I won't do that again. I don't think that has to be prescribed. And I think your point about language evolving, this isn't evolving. Evolving is natural. This is that what goes with the generations, what is gained and what is lost. This is prescribed, as Mark said, and it's wrong. You should not mandate speech. Oh, I didn't view through that in as a joke, but mandating is another good example, isn't it? Um, <coughs> I think... Uh, I was making a slightly different point about rules that, that because language evolves in every generation or every year, you make a rule and it will kind of be out of date, won't it, very quickly. So I think we're actually saying something similar, that if you have a rule, it can be quite a clunky mechanism for dealing with these types of things when it's actually better to be sensitive and open-minded because a rule can be out of date six months later. It really depends on how you define rule because uh, most of the time when it comes to communication, respect and language, it's, uh, and you know, being respectful and sensitive is about uh, more of like a direct co conversation, one on one. Uh, and that's fine. You know, if I talk to someone that want me to kind of use certain words or be respectful, you know, if I'm, you know, I have respect for them, I'll use it. But this is more of a, like the subconscious bias, unconscious bias, sort of micro uh, kind of triggering people that, you know, you might just be in a queue with your friend, make a joke. Someone in the corner might hear it and it's subjective. They will be offended on behalf of someone else who lives in Canada, who has a cousin in Africa. And it's just weird. It's just too complicated. Yeah, direct uh, offence or being uh, respectful, that's fine. But like, you know, being subjective on behalf of someone else, that's weird. What's your view, uh, GB Cat? With me for the next hour and 15 minutes, I'm delighted to say a brand new talent on the show, a very old friend of mine, Maya Tuzi, political commentator and broadcaster. Also a welcome addition to the lineup, Alice Watson Brown, political commentator and broadcaster, and an old friend of mine as well, Peter Edwards, former editor of Labour List. Lots of stories to get through. A new emergency number to help protect lone women could be up and running by Christmas. The Walk Me Home service is being developed as a response to the public outrage over the murder of Sarah Everard. With BT's chief executive, Philip Janssen, having written to the Home Secretary about the possible system. The scheme would allow anyone who feels vulnerable to have their journey tracked with an alert being triggered if they don't reach home in time. 
Women specifically will also be able to dial the potential 888 number to call the police if they feel threatened. But the app has sparked backlash after some women's groups criticised the move and called on the Home Secretary to tackle the issues facing women rather than restricting women's freedoms to accommodate male violence. Well, what do we think about this? Alice, would you feel safer with a special phone line? Well, there are already initiatives in place. There are certain apps called WalkSafe. I have that. Mm. Um, but also, I mean, all of my friends and I, we message each other. If I felt unsafe, I'd call 999. I don't know if it's really necessary to set up a new phone line. Mm. Is it financially viable? And also in the wake of the Sarah Everard murder, the tragedy that was around Wayne Cousins, um, mm. I don't know if it's attacking the root of the problem here, which is the gross negligence of the Metropolitan Police to vet these people and to ensure they do not have sexual predators in their force. And this yeah. phone line, is it going to be useful to women when they don't know that the, if the police officers who are going to turn up are going to save their lives or not. Does it feel like victim blaming? It's sort of the message of this special line is women have got to do more to take care of themselves. Yes, why, do we, why are we the ones who have to do more? You know, don't sort of protect your daughters, educate your sons. Mm. Um, I, I think there should be, it's not some kind of thing where women have to work harder. It's a collective effort. Men need to make sure that they don't, even engage in any weird behaviour when they're walking home with a woman. Mm. Um, keep the solidarity with your friends, but also just you need to not deflect the problem onto the women. They need to sort out the Metropolitan Police and their vetting process, because that is what ultimately led to the Sarah Everard tragedy. Maya, is this a gimmick? Well, it's one of those things. I think um, we, have to, we have to wait to find out more about how it's going to be implemented and what it actually is going to be like, because right now, all sides have a very instant reaction to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, for example, the left-wing uh, kind of feminist groups who are kicking off, they are saying that what they essentially want is no action. And they say, well, women have to be protected in some sort of weird bubble. And uh, instantly you have to make sure that men and uh, young boys become good. And they're all evil, you have to make them good. Like, how do we do it? Education, absolutely, it will take time. In terms of culture and society, we have to do that. As obviously Alice was saying, right now, this app could either become a gimmick, mm. could be a, a why come ha have the police do what they were supposed to be doing, mm. or it could just be, uh, if it goes well, it could be a collaboration between the, the citizens and the police actually working together in the sense that, you know, uh, it shouldn't be a gimmick. W women essentially are alerting the police um, and it's, it's all embarrassing that the police you know, should be more present in certain areas mm. especially, uh, but it could be the message that it's just supposed to be a cooperative, uh, cooperative uh, between uh, citizens and the police. Tony Blair's mantra, of course, was tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. Hard to argue with that, Peter. Does this really focus on the cause of the crime? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure the Blair mantra applies here because that was more mm. about poverty, I think, and mm. people growing up in marginalised communities. I think this initiative is right to put a lot of options on the table. Clearly, the trial of the Sarah Avard killer was a, a watershed moment. But as Alice says, I think we do have to try and restore public confidence in the police, and that's both around vetting, um, but also around clear messaging. And do remember that the vast, vast, vast majority of police, men and women, are very hardworking public servants who are on the front line all the time, including through the COVID crisis. Oh, I completely agree with you on that. And then here's the other question, Peter. Should this be split on gender lines? Because the streets are unsafe for the whole population, and in fact, attacks on men statistically is an even bigger problem. Yeah, I mean, I think this particular proposal about an 888 number was for threats against women. And the majority of the time when men suffer violence, that tends to be at the hands of other men mm. in different environments. I also think Alice made a good point that there's a similar initiative to 888 kind of coming through the private sector around women developing apps. So is there a, risk, a little bit of a risk of duplication? Uh, Leona has emailed the programme Leona, thank you so much for your message. Mark, men should be more responsible, of course, but then so should women and stop doing the disgraceful porn which turns men into monsters. Well, that's a, perhaps, you know, a complex area and a conversation for the future. Um, can I ask you, Alice, what would make you feel safer on the streets as a female? What, what do you think needs to happen? Well, I think resources, knowing who to call. And it, for me, 999. Um, that's mm. what I would do. 
Uh, and you, what you'd like to know is that 999 actually works and that help yes, will come. You don't need a special number, just a no, number that works. Exactly, the, the number that you were taught from childhood to call with anything. Not a special wrong. ladies number. No, you don't need a special ladies number. I think if there's an emergency, you know, whether you think you're going to get raped or not, you just call 999. Um, and I think there are certain issues like street lighting can actually make a big difference. And actually, in fairness to organisations like the AA and the RAC, they actually prioritise women on their own in a car, mm. which I think is the right thing to do. I think those initiatives do make a big difference. Mm. Um, as I said, things like street lighting, possibly um, knowing that there is a shop you can go into, um, mm. going, OK, well, there's an off-licence that closes at 11, I know that, I'm just going to go in there and then at least someone's in there. Um, but obviously... There is an element you can't really do anything when you're at 4 a.m. on your own in the dark. Um, that is, there is a certain risk going out. And as you said, women, it happens to women and men. I think men are two and a half more times to be likely to be murdered in the street than women. Um, and I think it is, there, it comes an essence of personal responsibility when you do go out at, you know, at times when you know you're going to be vulnerable. Does Leona have a point when she talks about something like porn, that there is an attitude to women now in society that to attack women, to see women as a sexual object is, is the problem in our society. It's a cultural problem now. I think women have always been sexualized, regardless of OnlyFans. Mm. Uh, OnlyFans is a choice that some women take. I think they do need to understand that defining the career by your body uh, will attract certain opinions, as will defining your career by your intellect. Mm. Um, I do not think these women should necessarily be blamed for the rapes of other women. Mm. I think that is completely unfounded. Mm. Um, that there are, you know, there are certain cultural effects of, you know, expanding porn industries. But that, <laughs> thankfully, that's what feminism in the modern day has brought us, that it is their choice. But they do need to understand that if you sell yourself on the basis of your body, you will most likely get some sexualized comments back. And also, there, is a, there are a lot of anecdotes at the moment about univer female university students having their drinks spiked. Yes, well, I, I, that happened to me in... It was my third day of freshers. No. Um, it was very... I don't know, it was very scary. I, don't, I blacked out for two hours and I remember being taken off by some random man. Um, and, well, yeah, the next couple of days were pretty, pretty strange. Um, I look back on that and, I, you know, I, I got over it. Um, but that's just a risk I took. I was in a club. I didn't know anyone there. I was with freshers. You're just with pe people who you meet that night. And yeah, there's a certain amount of risk. Could have been me, could have been anyone, could have been a bloke. You don't know. But I would never wish that on anyone. This is absolutely evil. It's a shocking story. And um, I mean, does it, does it feel like things are getting worse? Or would you say it was ever thus? Well, I think... It's always so easy to say things are getting worse, but I think with social media, mm. people are always talking about it. I mean, there was that video in Bristol, my university town, uh, with these two horrible people spiking this girl's drink. And thankfully, they've been reprimanded and put behind bars now. But there are many women like myself who do not know who did that to them uh, and are still sometimes get a little anxious when they're out, you know, just in case. Um, yeah. And I think there probably should be some kind of easy kit you can take with you when you go out just to check if your drink's been spiked but personally i always just do it I buy bottles just open my own bottles myself yeah that's uh, that's what it's come to uh, truly shocking stuff now the prime minister boris johnson has reportedly decided not to back plans to relax the laws on assisted dying which is expected to be debated by mps in the coming months the prime minister has apparently come to this new decision after he reviewed the pros and cons during his summer break despite speculation that he had been leaning towards changing the rules. The assisted dying bill, which was put forward by Baroness Meacher, would give terminally ill and mentally competent adults in the final six months of their lives the option to die at a time and place of their choosing, with approval needed from two independent doctors and a high court judge. Historically, assisted dying has been considered an issue of conscience, with parties not instructing MPs to support a particular position and under the Suicide Act of 1961, it's illegal to encourage or assist the death of another person. But, Mayor, what do you think? I mean, I, I, my view is that if you're terminally ill, it's your choice when to go. That's, that's the idiocy of uh, the opposition to this point, because mm. if, when it comes to general euthanasia and the whole concept, yeah, that's a wider debate because there are different versions. You know, you've got the voluntary and kind of active, then you've got the and when you're not actually conscious, you know, yeah, then you don't, it's not really by choice, mm. but you made a decision before, but if you change your mind, but you're not conscious, that could get messy and complicated. Mm. But this is a very specific 
piece of proposal and it has to be accepted because firstly conscious uh, mentally stable essentially this is by choice it's very active but politicians are just too scared and it's classic uh, Westminster bubble not realizing that the, the rest of the country out there, of course they will have different opinions, but this is the safest option to start from somewhere. And uh, a lot of people out there might just look at this headline and they will assume that is, we're talking about the general euthanasia, which could be a very different topic. This, this is not that, it's very simple. It's not, you know, there are a lot of people who, it, the state should not t force you to live. If you choose not to live, it's not the job of the state to play God. Peter? Well, let's take party politics out of it. I think Boris Johnson is right if he is going to end up going for what's called a free vote in the House of Commons where um, MPs can vote according to their conscience. I think that's the right thing to do. I'm slightly sceptical as to whether the law will change for the, the reasons Maya set out, that it's such a big topic and it, it dwarfs in its seriousness and ramifications to ordinary things like tax and spend. Will MPs vote to change the law? I find it very hard actually to see that happening. What do you think about this? I mean, uh, you know, this is obviously a huge moral minefield, isn't it? Yeah, it's personal conscience. And I think that is why it's proving such an issue for the government, as they, they cannot account for everyone else. It's so subjective. I mean, I know if I found out I had a terminal illness and was going to die, you know, within six months or wasn't going to be able to move, I'd be like, yeah, I, I don't want to live. I can't be a person. Then I just want to go. I'm not mm. having a fulfilling life. It's about quality of life. Um, and I think... If this initiative is passed, I do not think it should be state funded. Mm. I don't think the state should have anything to do with this kind of assisted dying or, or euthanasia or whatever. Yeah. Sets a dangerous called. precedent. Yes, I think the state it should be completely. Because then you get, can get assisted dying on the NHS. Yes, which yeah. I, is not the job for the NHS. Yeah, mm. it is about the role of the state. But the paranoia is interesting because uh, it was the opposition to against the. Um, uh, gay marriage was that mm. they, they assumed that the state is promoting it and some people were saying well that means the government is going to go out there and basically push for gay marriage and turn people gay and, and make them mm. be married mm. it's not supposed to be like that they, as society we're still going to be encouraging people to live mm. as long as the, gov the government is not going to be pushing it and uh, you know, I absolutely agree it should not be a state uh, funded or kind of operated in that sense but the state is actually withdrawing its uh, role by doing that it's saying that I now allow you to do it. And mm. it's going, there are a lot of safeguards, as you said, you know, and you have to be yeah. six months before high court and everything mm. else. So, yep. Uh, do you think the state is treating us like children when it comes to the current circumstances? Well, and that we're not sovereign over our own bodies? Not just current circumstances, on every issue yeah. in our lives. And it's a very interesting thing in, in this country, because the West is going through this phase right now, yeah. And nanny statism and everything else like mm. that. But the, the British political system uh, is actually, has been built on statism. Um, and you know, we because it was based on you know the Church of England and the constitutional monarchy, and we evolved it into slightly more pro freedom over time. And now it's slightly going backwards again, including things like the NHS having a, a state religion, and you can't even touch the NHS. You can't even reform the NHS because it's you know it's supposed to be part of one of your parents. Mm. That, so that's one of your that's parents. complete nonsense. The NHS has been reformed by every government for twenty years. Whether you like the reforms or not, I personally, and I imagine we all do, believe usually in NHS. But the idea that it's untouched is nonsense. It changes with every Bureaucratic government. Bureaucratic reform is not actual reform. We're talking about, if, if anyone comes and dares to actually say, let's uh, rethink the model, let's change the model, let's get the best case studies from Western Europe or Northern Europe uh, to kind of see if we could replace the model, you can't do that. Yeah, you could, uh, do, you could say, OK, let's do regional trust, or let's say this bureaucrat from uh, Elephant Castle could run it instead okay. of Manchester. Well, yeah. do you know what? The clock's against us, but I'm sure we will return to that debate. So. Uh... It's time now to look at which headlines are breaking and what will be in tomorrow's news tonight in our media buzz. Uh, with me for the final 30 minutes of the show, I'm delighted to say Maya Tuzi is here, political commentator and broadcaster. Alice Watson-Brown, political commentator and Peter Edwards, former editor of Labour List. Levies on gas bills to help fund low carbon heating are set to be announced within the next fortnight despite rising prices. The government will publish a new strategy with a carbon pricing scheme that could push gas bills significantly higher. The strategy will seek to end price distortions by removing green levies from electricity bills over the next decade and imposing new charges on gas bills. But ministers have been warned that average annual energy bills could reach £2,000 next year, with industry leaders warning that factories could be forced to stop production if costs continue 
to rise. This does not make, does it, Peter Edwards, for good reading? No, not at all. And, you know, I'm always wary of being too party political because not every problem in society goes back to the government, but this one does. Mm. Uh, Britain already relies on Qatar and I believe Norway for a lot of its gas. Yeah. It's possible we could become more reliant on someone like Russia, which is not a prospect any of us feel happy about, given the political machinations of energy supply in Russia. The government's been in power for 11 years. Why don't we have more capacity? Yes, I completely agree. And also more storage, because we actually closed down one storage facility in Yorkshire in 2017 under Prime Minister Theresa May. What do you think about this, Alice? I think it's severely out of touch. I mean, they're not considering. I also think it's quite clever, actually, that they didn't mention this in the Conservative conference <laughs> in his little speech about levelling up. But the poorest people of this country, the hard working taxpayers, already going to be paying £250 extra a year mm. for national insurance. And then are now an extra £170 per year on these gas on these gas hikes yeah. uh, to encourage them to buy an £8,000 um, gas pump mm. in their homes. It's like, how on earth do you expect these people to acquiesce and live, put meals on the table and be happy with you? It, yes, and then the, problem, the, the issue you've got is that I understand, and I'm sure Peter would argue this perhaps persuasively, that if you're going to force people to have a, a you know, more environmentally friendly boiler or car, you'll have to subsidise it. But, but that is actually going to be state spending, which is our money once again. It's got to come from somewhere. Well, exactly. So we pay for it anyway. It's going to, always going to come out of taxation, no matter how much they try and deflect that. It will be at the taxpayer's cost. Um, and I think especially when it comes to electric cars, well, uh, the most lithium supplies in Afghanistan, and that's helpful at the moment, isn't it? Mm. Um, and I think they're going, I think with the green agenda, it's going about the wrong way. They are completely ignoring nuclear power. I mean, look at France. They, they, 70 percent of their electricity is made off nuclear power plants and they earn, I'd say, around 30 billion euros per year on yeah. export costs. Yeah. Why are we ignoring this? It's safe. I know there is a lot of stigma about nuclear power, but it is safe and it is effective and we have we have the capacity for it. But they're not. Don't you think nuclear power is the love that dare not speak its name? Because everything we read tells us Boris Johnson is quite keen on nuclear power, but he's not coming out and saying that, is he? For exactly the reasons you describe, it seems at odds with his green agenda. But that's, that's their, their biggest mm. problem, because uh, politicians in charge these days, they're not leading anymore, they're following, but they're following mm. the wrong crowd. They have no integrity. Uh, well, yeah, that's the issue, because um, the, the green lobby have already been bullying politicians and the establishment enough anyway. Now, when I say this, you know, the people who are very much into all the pro-climate change kind of uh, measures, would say that, oh, that means you don't care. It's not about that. It's about what sort of lobby and what sort of measure. Because yes. the one perfect thing you can do, not just the uh, nuclear uh, plants, you know, especially smaller ones, you could have multiple ones. Yeah. The one thing that no one you know, is brave enough to even mention is the one thing that Boris Johnson spent years mentioning it, extracting shale gas. Yes. Now that's becoming safer, now it's becoming more advanced and modern, and we have a lot of it here. It's ridiculous that we haven't been fracking, and America sure. enjoys energy independence that's thanks how to it. it and we have decades worth of shale gas yes. available on our shores. Yep. And just do it. It's not that difficult. Now that we have the technology, it's not like in the decades ago where mistakes happen. Of course, it always happens with anything. Uh, in but also, don't you think that our energy demands shouldn't be based on student politics? I said it in yesterday's <laughs> monologue, right? Which is, go woke, no yep. smoke. I yep. mean, you're being ultra-politically correct yep. about things like fracking. And yep. the bottom line is that we don't have enough no, energy. Sorry, that, We've got to go crying to Vladimir Putin. That's non nonsense. It's nothing to do with political correctness. <laughs> of course it is. He's entrapped in the own green agenda. He's set himself. Is. Fracking is... It, it, it is political. You know, no, fracking no, is demonised by yes, it's the politically woke correct. students. It's, yes, exactly. <laughs> I don't Not form awesome. my views on fracking because of woke students. I form them because of earthquakes. But <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, it's not clear that fracking is dangerous. Yeah. No. And uh, they just began to explore and to actually test some of these particular beds. Yep. And there were one or two issues, but I don't think that's an excuse for stopping the whole project. It's clear there's risk. I think it's not proven either way, but it's certainly mm. clear there's risk. But, but isn't it, there risk with wind power, solar risk. power? Yeah, risk with everything. <laughs> there's no supply. Well, there's, there's risk when, when it's not windy, which it yeah. wasn't this summer. <laughs> yeah. But that's not a safety risk to, compared to triggering an earthquake. Well, it could be it? a safety risk if you can't get energy from your home and you freeze. Or, you know, food can't be transported. That is a safety risk. But this is about... That's the... massive... Hold on, I think that's massively conflating several issues. We're talking about creating the power in the first place. The objection to shale gas is there's a suspicion, and science is still emerging, that it triggers earthquakes. Generating wind power does not trigger earthquakes. But that's all... But again, the, the places that, including parts of America, that have uh, consistently been doing it, 
we know that generally, firstly, America is still surviving. Americans are still alive. Much more it's, susceptible to earthquakes. And, and we also know, just like nuclear, um, the health and safety around it has become more advanced. It's becoming safer. It's becoming more cautious. And they all they have to do is get there, extract and get out. They don't have to even keep the station. And I'm sure that the shale gas exploration companies will be very mindful of, of any potential mm. earth tremors, but they'd like the opportunity to, to explore mm -hmm. and to, to do a bit of a cost benefit analysis. But that was halted because of campaigners. Yes. Well, that's I mean, the if you've got of billions, any topic if you've to got try and achieve billions change. of quids worth of potential shale gas, you know, on your shores, you're going to explore. You're going to have a look at that. Only once you've got certainty over safety. Well, yeah, let's do that. We're not, we're not even allowed we to even talk that about it. We can't even talk about it. At least let's talk about it. Let's start. Let's analyze. But you know, the problem step. is fracking has become political. Exactly. Frack off, as they say. <laughs> and there you go. We're post watershed. You enjoy yourself there, Alice. <laughs> Two men who spent a month lost at sea have said that their impromptu break from civilization was actually a welcome holiday. Uh, Live Nan Jikanana and Junior Coloni, a pair of sailors from the Solomon Islands, set out to travel to New Georgia Island, but their GPS system failed and left them lost on the high seas. Surviving on oranges, coconut and rainwater, they floated about 400 kilometers northwest for 29 days, eventually spotting a fisher near uh, Papua New Guinea. Yep. Uh, but Nanjikana is a glass half full kind of guy and he was keen to take the positives. He said he was relieved to hear nothing about COVID for a month and described it as a nice break from everything. And I couldn't agree more with that. Well, we're going to take a break. Now, um, my panel are still with me for the rest of the show. Maya Tuzi, uh, political commentator and broadcaster, Alice Watson-Brown, political commentator, and Peter Edwards, a broadcaster and former editor of Labour List. Uh, lots of emails coming in across various topics. Barbara, thanks for your email. Barbara says, how is net zero going to be achieved if we don't use our own money to pay for it? Not just the taxpayer, but individuals and those on unavoidable low incomes can be assisted if necessary. Um, meanwhile, um, Christine, on the news that British Airways are no longer going to address passengers as ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mark says, Christine, how are BA going to address their customers? What the hell is wrong with ladies and gentlemen? Um, that's 98% of who everyone is. Surely it's being disrespectful to all of us who believe ourselves to be ladies or gentlemen. What about our inclusivity? Ridiculous. Christine, thank you for sharing your views on that one. Uh, Robert Page, uh, what nobody has mentioned about Margaret Thatcher is that under Thatcher, interest rates were 18 percent. Hashtag just saying. Uh, Robert, <laughs> thank you for pointing that one out. And uh, David Wilson has written a fantastic email. Dave, uh, love what you've written here about uh, BA no longer calling passengers ladies and gentlemen. Um, and David says, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. You have been cancelled and must now leave this plane immediately. We are flying at 38,000 feet and parachutes will be given to you shortly. Thank you for flying with Woke Airways. But seriously, says Dave, I give up. What's next? Dave, that was a pitch perfect email. Thank you for it. Let's get back to my panel and our fabulous stories. Rookie teachers are quitting before the end of their first year, a shock study has found. Fed up class leaders are abandoning the classroom at a record rate with staying on figures reaching a 24-year low. Records show that 15% quit after a year and nearly a quarter leave within three years due to concerns over pay, increased workload and the challenging nature of working in disadvantaged areas. The worrying trend comes at a time when schools are struggling to recruit staff for subjects such as science and maths. And Peter, we're seeing this in the NHS as well. Um, the Observer's headline, Nursing Crisis Sweeps Wards as NHS battles to find recruits. Very surprising that as we come out of the pandemic, we thought there would be enormous unemployment, whereas actually there are not enough people to do all the jobs. Well, yeah, it's, we're in a very remarkable position. I think on teaching, the first year in any career, whether it's law or teaching or medicine, is really tough. You know, mm. in my first year as a reporter, I had no idea what I was doing, and I probably had no idea what I was doing for several years subsequently. But in terms of people uh, in the NHS and in the classroom, Think about what their life has been working through the pandemic. Yeah. Very unnerving, yeah. lots of risk, very uncomfortable. So I have a lot of sympathy for them. And I think this, is, this to be fair, is a problem that would face any government. Mm -hmm. How do you retain 
teachers and NHS staff after a pandemic. Mm. You've got to get the PPE right, which the government did not did, but we are where we are. Mm. Yeah, what do you think uh, about this, Alice? Because, I mean, teaching is, you know, it should be an attractive profession. And I do believe that applications for teaching positions grew in the course of the pandemic, with lots of people who are self-employed losing their jobs, thinking they'd like something more secure. But uh, any successful business, any successful organisation hangs on to its staff. I agree. I think teaching is one of them is the most important job you can do in this country. Mm. You, you know, you forefront the future leaders, the thinkers of the of the nation. Um, I think it's probably definitely to do with pay, as you say, working in disadvantaged schools. I think the prospect of going back to work, um, if you you know think your your children are going to have to go home, your whole mm. class is going to be stopped. It's not an attractive prospect. But I think thinking on the NHS and staff shortages shortages it's quite ironic that you know they're suffering this when they have introduced these vaccine mandates for their staff how can they you know have to fire i think it's something about eight percent of people in the social care industry that who haven't been jabbed yet they're going to have to fire them and yet they're still going on about staff shortages so they really do have to balance these factors and think well what can we lose out on here yeah i mean hey is there an element of wokery here is there an element of snowflake generation yeah and because the issue is um we could take it towards you know covid and the mm. public servants and of course uh, the nhs workers and we say because of that it's been hard of course they worked really hard but this problem that we're talking about and teachers and it, as a um, sector is just one is the concept of certain jobs or most jobs are tough uh, for the snowflake generation and that's basically the millennial generation onwards and that's a problem because I actually know three or four friends, um, you know, younger people who got into teaching because of the passion that they had, you know, they, they wanted to focus on that part of it. They were not expecting the rest of it, including the fact that they had to do, you know, uh, still do some admin and obviously work, you know, even when they come home, they have to do their work uh, and all the paperwork and everything else like that. They expected to just be like, oh, is it just like nine to three? Is that it? They did not focus on that part of it. And so it's all about, this generation is about, from their intentions, focus on the values and all I care about this, this is my passion, I'm going to change the world. But they don't realize that the real life also comes with the bureaucracy, the admin, the, the you know, long hours, the things like that. They're not ready for it. This generation was not prepared by our parents and obviously the, the whole society mm. uh, for the fact that life could be tough. And, you this know, is nothing to do with vocary. I'm sorry for interrupting so much. It's nothing to do with vocary. If you've been a teacher in yeah. a pandemic, not the role you're doing is fundamentally before. different. This is happening before. In the last few years we've had, uh, we're losing teachers more. Just before, before the pandemic, uh, we've had uh, shortages when it comes to teaching. And people come in, but they leave. It's just been magnified now. This is not a new problem. It's been, it's been happening for like a few years. Oh, ago. I do accept that. But could that yeah. be anything to do with Tory government running down the contribution of public sector professionals? No, it's about the fact that everything's run by the state. You know, of course, you know, being a public um, worker is just you, but that's it's not an attractive job. Not it all may, schools are run by the state. That's no, just wrong. No, no, but in, the, the culture is still, uh, it, you still count as a public worker. It's not a, uh, it's not, you, you, that's just wrong. You don't have the same um, system where the flexibility to be able to empower the workers, uh, to incentivize them properly, to actually, instead of going through this offset stuff and do all these uh, bureaucratic tick bo uh, tick bo um, that, box ticking and everything. It's just like wrong. That. If you work at a boarding school, if you work at Eton, you're not yeah. an employee of the state and you're not inspected by Austin. Perfect. Let, do a survey. Let's do a survey on, um, ask the opinions uh, from the uh, private sector teachers and how they go through. Because, of course, there will be a wide range in terms of the opinions. But overall, the success that they're having, the support that they're having from their schools and people around, the, you know, the, obviously the governors and everyone else, and, and also the pay. When you make things, a job more attractive, it's, just, it's not just about the passion of the cause, what you're doing. It's also about the actual job. It's not just about... So what's your point, though? You have to make these things more attractive. You have to make these jobs more attractive. Of course, in terms of... So do you of, think uh, that schools should be... State schools should be a bit more entrepreneurial and should more incentivize people to stay? More independent. The state should not be in, uh, involved with education. So they have a budget. The school gets a budget mm -hmm. and they spend it as they so wish. Yeah, and, and management as well. Yeah, we just let, make it less bureaucratic in terms of running it. So just to be clear, you're saying the state should not be involved in education. Yep. That's what you just said. Yep. So you want to privatise the entire education system? Denationalise it, not privatise. There's, there's a different terms. You get, because people, people so give head teachers, teachers the money and let them spend it as they say. More wish. autonomy. Well, more autonomy. We already more have than, a lot of that with free schools and academies. Academies are a good start. Definitely a good step. You could go further.
And do you want to, if you want to privatise the school system, do you want to privatise the NHS no, as decentralize well? Decentralise it, essentially. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Decentralise it. Do it in the European model with, with the healthcare system. Absolutely. Mike, I think you're in the <laughs> foothills of the mountains of madness. Well, no, it works. It works in Europe. It could work here. It's, it's not some sort of utopia. <laughs> when it works somewhere else, you don't have to copy and paste. Just make it more towards the British system, but you can still copy and paste the best practice. The left just doesn't want to even consider any big reform, any change of modelling. You know, you, you would reform, just like in the NHS, the admin side of it, we don't really actually want to change the model. That's the problem. Well, that's wrong. The Blair government introduced academies. That was an enormous change. They also did yeah. public-private partnerships to help the NHS and build schools. Yeah. yeah, so the Labour government introduced a lot of reforms in education yeah. and health. Yeah. So, what, what, so you're saying that the left mm -hmm. doesn't want to embrace change. Yeah. That just collapses immediately. No, not really. Firstly, the left, not the new Labour. Slight differences. But also, um, as I said, academies and free schools, great first step. You can go further. Schools. And well, grammar schools on a different level, absolutely early days. It, it's just a good first step. So you could go further. We just hit the wall now. Both centre left and centre right don't even want to, you know, to consider any further reform. Well, David has emailed this uh, on this topic. David, thanks very much for your email. David says, I am a teacher of 61, and it's not a question of money. Throwing money is not the answer. We are open to COVID, and class sizes are getting bigger, and the children's behaviour is really bad. I would rather stack shelves. Teaching is not a career I would recommend. Please read this out. Well, read this out. I was happy to do, David, and thank you for sharing that. And I'm really, really sorry to hear what you're going through in the classroom. No teacher should have to put up with bad behaviour from students. And Mick says, Mark, most teachers should be sacked anyway. They should be teaching facts, not opinions. Thank you, Mick. Now, it's an opinion here that Renée Zellweger has been criticised for wearing a fat suit as she takes on the role of murderer Pam Hupp. The decision has been branded damaging, fat phobic and potentially triggering to fat people. The Bridget Jones actress was spotted donning the suit on set for her upcoming NBC series, The Thing About Pam. She wore the suit under jeans and a puffer jacket, wearing her hair in a bob as she mirrored the killer's look. And uh, Alice, I mean, the bottom line is if she's playing a character that has a high body mass index, she's going to wear a fat suit. Well, yeah, there's the whole fat suit palaver which has been going on for years. I mean, Bridget Jones as a film franchise has been massively criticised about, you know, her whole journey to lose weight when she wasn't even that fat. Um, it's hard to kind of... Yeah, I kind of had to sidestep on this one. Um, he, is it weird if someone, you know, loses weight for a film if they want to play a skinny person? Is it weird in Marvel and Captain America that they, you know, computer generate his body to represent, mm. you know, a lanky, you know, skinny young man? Not really, but I think when it comes to wearing fat suits, that is highly controversial. Um, I think, well, if it's her choice as an actress to do it, then it's her choice and she should be allowed to. But the, the opinions should be here on both sides. I don't think there should be classes fat phobic or triggering. I think this has to be a constant ongoing debate about body positivity and representation among women. And it depends on how her character is depicted in that film. Is she depicted, you know, badly because she is fat or because of her personality? There has to yeah. be some nuance here. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Well, Rene chubbing up got us thinking of other actors and actresses who fully embraced their character's features. So we thought we would play a game of you are prosthetic. Can my panel guess the clandestine celebs in their, their prosthetic outfits? So here we go. Here's number one. Uh, which famous actor is this? John Travolta. John Travolta. Travolta in Hairspray. Well done. Straight in there. Peter Edwards, big Travolta fan, clearly. <laughs> uh, next up, Meryl, Meryl Streep. Why well, well, I've just given it all away. Oh, I think that's Meryl Streep. My, <laughs> my dream of being a TV game show host is in tatters. That's right. That was Meryl Streep. I'm, I've turned into Anchorman. I just say anything that's in front of me. OK, who's this? Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman. Sirius Black. <laughs> it is indeed. It was Gary Oldman. <laughs> OK, now we're going to show you the next one. Which other? Who is this? Oh, oh, oh. I don't know the actor. Yeah, oh, I was No, but... Well, he's in everything. Peter Edwards. He's always in no, everything. No, don't know. No, he's... he's, he's... It's, it's yeah. Warwick Davis. Warwick Davis. Yeah. Rip Hock in Griffith. Harry Potter. OK, and how about your next one? Here's your next celeb Ooh. in prosthetics. Oh. Oh. Isn't he in Hook, that film? I can't remember. OK, let's take a look. Bob yeah. Dolan. I wish it was. <laughs> Glenn Close. He didn't uh, even get the gender uh, right. It wasn't Hook. I was right. Oh, there you go. Actually, good point. You get yeah. half a point for Hook. Well Brilliant. done. OK, how about uh, our next one? Right. Now, oh. who is that? Uh, 
Did you play Dick Cheney in Vice? Um, no idea. <laughs> You are that's right. A, Christopher, that's actually the, that's the actual film. <laughs> Maya gets the points. It's Dick Cheney <laughs> in Vice. And that is the actor before his prosthetics. Fantastic stuff. Well, well done to the team for putting together an excellent game there. <laughs> and uh, that was uh, impressive that I managed to say prosthetics. Uh, it's time now for this. It's time for my panel to reveal their Greatest Britain and Union jackass. Alice, your Greatest Britain. Well, this is uh, in memory of the late James Brokenshire. Mm. Um, I chose this because he was the first ever politician I heard speak. I was very privileged. He came to my school and spoke. This was 2017, 2018. I was a, you know, innocent, naive politics A-level student. Um, and I just sat there in the audience wide out being like, wow, a real MP. Um, and I was the most annoying person. I asked him a very annoying question about the House of Lords and Brexit. And poor man, it was in the midst of the whole just mm. stalemate with Theresa May. And he was very respectful and didn't really answer it. And I was very cross. But then I look back and go, oh, yeah, OK, well, probably shouldn't have asked that. He was going through a rough time. Um, so, yeah, I think he was also he bought a sort of rare attitude into politics of being a friend, loved on both sides, even Sakir Starmer. Um, published a wholehearted tweet about his memory, and so yeah, I nominate him. Clearly, a remarkable and very yeah. special guy who will be who will be missed, uh, obviously, by his family and missed from public life. Peter, your greatest Britain. Yes, and I, I would agree about James Brokenshaw. I thought it was a very intelligent, committed, mm. and thoughtful public servant. Um, for uh, heroes tonight, I'm actually going to go global uh, uh, as a journalist, as you are, and. Nominate, let me get the names right, Maria Ressa and Dmitry Moratov, who won the Nobel Prize this week for campaigning journalism in Brilliant. the Philippines and in Russia, taking on authoritarianism and government corruption. Uh, what a brilliant nomination. Hard one to follow that, uh, Maya, but what have you got for Definitely us? very hard. Uh, I'm going to go with Professor Kathleen Stock uh, in, uh, from the University of Sussex, who is one of, gave us one of the rare victories for, for free speech because um, she dared to even discuss the ideas of uh, uh, transgender issues and just as a debate tried to open it, she, they tried to counsel her. Mm. She said no, and she had enough support, thanks to the vice chancellor as well, yes. and she survived. Yes, good to see uh, an institution having a backbone yes. for once. Uh, how about your union jackass? Yes, Emmanuel Macron. <laughs> he's uh, been very, very difficult. He should really be on like every week though. But uh, <laughs> recently he's been causing a lot of trouble with uh, one of his closest allies, the United Kingdom. Yeah. Um, if he believes that we're uh, really an allies, he would not break his agreement with Priti Patel on illegal migration. Yeah. He would not threaten to ban exports to the UK or cut off electricity uh, and or try to steal our vaccines. It's just not really going well for Macron. And you know, he's not a good friend right now. I think that's a brilliant observation. Can't disagree. Only a few seconds to go, your union jackass? Sir Peter Bottomley, with his wholehearted complaint about his salary. I feel so sorry Only for him. Only 80 grand. Yeah, tell, tell that to, you know, the businesses you've wrecked with your lockdown policies. Uh, yeah, that's... Um all I have to say, really. And Peter Edwards, <laughs> you get the last word. Well, I'm not going to nominate any villains or jackasses. I've nominated two heroes, and I guess in the Labour Party, we all need to chill out a bit and uh, <laughs> not call in on scum, and uh, we'll just be a little bit nicer for a week. Aww. Well, uh, amen to that. Brilliant stuff. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed tonight's show. My thanks to my fabulous panel, who I think you'll agree aced it. Uh, also, my amazing team, who worked so hard today.